Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Another Saturday night. But again, you're just you start with us two, basically. But I hope you're all well. Uh, <laughs> how you doing, mate? You good? Yeah, good, mate. Just had to um, part with that 90 minutes of absolute rubbish. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you fell asleep halfway through. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I could, the torture was too much for me. Um, I couldn't really... I'd go through the whole 90 minutes. I think I lasted about a good 45. And after 45, I was done. Done and dusted, mate. Yeah. That was for me. So, yeah. yeah it was terrible. It was, just, it was just like poor finishing. William should have scored. Pepe should have scored. Uh, Cavani should have scored. It was just bad. It was just poor. Poor finishing. Gosh. And the thing is, as well, what I hate the most about these overhyped games, they never usually come to something. Like, if it's Arsenal, Man United... Or Liverpool, Chelsea, or one of these big games that they always overhype. They never usually come to anything good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So not like the old, um, not like the old Arsenal, Man United games. Roy yeah, Keane yeah. and Vieira and Van Nistelrooy, Tony Adams, Keown. Oh my god! Yeah, those oh, proper games. Those proper games. Those were the days, man. Now, now you can't really build anything around it because let's face it, it's nothing. Yeah. Well, I, I had I had I had Oli uh, Solskjaer after the game saying how happy he was with the point and, and how happy he was with the performance and that. And I just can't I can't accept that. Just oh, I just don't think they play. I just don't I don't get excited about Man United at all tonight. Yeah, but, no, I'm not a Man United fan. Probably Man United fans watching this will be having kittens and calling me all sorts. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if he's up in about a nil-nil, then that shows the levels that we've come to right now anyway. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I just want to shout out, obviously, shout out to Junction Elite, fucking the, the new Junction Elite kit as well. So, shout out to them as well for, for sending that. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. top kit. Top kit, top club. Yeah, top club indeed. And, um, yeah, Kobe, mate, we've got another um, array of guests coming up tonight. So, talk through who we've yeah. got tonight. Well, we've got uh, James Beardwell. He's on first. Um, we'll get him on in a minute. I think he's on in the background at the moment. We've got um, Ali Maloney, the physio for SC Dons and Cray Wanderers. We've got my old strike partner, Jamie Richards. And um, and we've got a legend um, of the football world, Jamie Curriton. Uh, so, yeah, so some fantastic guests again, following on from all the others that we've had previously. I think the list of guests that we've had is like it's it's, it's quality, isn't it? It's quality it's, so far. Even even the Friday nights. Obviously, last night we were speaking to Michael Johnson as well, and we both learned, yeah. didn't we? Oh, mate, that was that was unreal. That was unreal last night. I mean, it just flowed. It just flowed and flowed and flowed, and you could we, again we could have been talking for hours. Um, exactly. we spoke people. If, 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 if any of the listeners take anything out of it and. You know, they learn something from it. That's that's what we're here for, isn't it? That's what we're here for to do. Let the let the guests have their say, share their experiences, and pass on some knowledge. That's what we're in the football for. And now you've got a you got an England training session potentially to go to as well. You never know. Yes, you know? yes, mate. I went shopping today. I've all, I've got ten packs of chocolate obnobs. <laughs> <laughs> I've bought some tea bags. So <laughs> if if MJ's listening, <laughs> it's on, mate. Ready, mate. As soon as you're giving him the call up he's there mate <laughs> yeah it's on it's on <laughs> oh dear but yes again thank you for all listening and watching in as well please make sure you like and subscribe just early doors and again yeah. uh, just again, keep supporting us really because again it's going to keep getting better and better yeah. so going to bring in the first guest he's waiting in the wings there here he is Mr. hello James. how are you doing hello, James you right yeah good thank you how are you doing Good, thank you, mate. You had a good day? Yeah, I had a good day, thank you. How long has it you been? Did you do your run today? Um, I haven't done my run today, but I did my running yesterday. I've done my fourth log of my outdoor running, and I've done incredibly well over the last like few days, like especially with the third national lockdown going on at the moment. And I know it's been tough for some people, but the yeah. second national lockdown was really bad. It was a, it was a massive struggle. But when it went into the third national lockdown, I thought it was going to be another struggle again. But, but I thought to myself, how about doing an outdoor running? Because I thought this would create plenty more positivity because it would inspire more people. That For the ones who are really, really struggling with the third national lockdown, 
and I thought about doing the vlog, it would be like re really good. You definitely inspired me as well, mate, because even during this uh, last lockdown, I've been doing a lot of running. I've been going onto your Instagram page and seeing, okay, James is doing this, so I've got to keep up as well, man. So it's, it's good to see, man. Good to see you in good health and good to see you keep persevering as well, mate. Yeah, it's really, really good. And I, I really miss going to see the DTFC game since the lockdown has started because I I really enjoy going to the DTFC game so much. And it's it's my main leisure activity, like traveling to the DTFC games on, on the trains home and home and away. And it because because football's my main get out to watch DTFC in the, in the weekends on the Saturdays. I really enjoy the most. And I got on so well with the DTFC lads as always. Wicked, wicked, wicked. Uh, I think we just lost Kobe. I think he's coming back now. Here he is. What happened yeah, there? Sorry. My, no, well, I haven't charged my laptop all day and it's, it's just gone off. <laughs> yeah, I had to struggle, struggle and put the, uh, the charger back in. Sorry about that. That's all right. Oh, um, mate. He's just talking us through, obviously, his runs and stuff, but... We know, we heard about your runs and stuff, but we just want to learn a little bit more about you, James, as a person, because obviously we can see DTFC in the background. We know you're a DTFC ultra, but talk to us a yeah. about, you know, how you first got into football as well. How I first got into football? Um, yeah. Many years ago, I used to support my homeland club, Whitton Town, like 14 years ago. It was my local football team because I live in Whitton. And, but since I supporting DTFC I've really enjoyed more supporting DTFC because I've gotten well with the lads and they treat me a lot better of DTFC and and I, and I just feel much happier supporting DTFC on, on the Saturdays and I just feel more comfortable supporting DTFC as well Is that because there's more of you? Is that because there's more of you there? There's, I know that DTFC have got a few more fans than Whitsum have is that do you feel more comfortable because there's a lot more of you there, or because at Whitsum you was the only one, you was the only one, pretty much, wasn't you? Yeah, I was the only one, but sometimes I get sometimes it sometimes it got a bit bit of like pear shape at the moment at Whitton Town because like because a lot of people have been asking me saying like James when when are you going to be coming back supporting Whitton Town and I said yeah. I, I feel so much happier supporting DTFC because I've got on well with the lads and it's not just about performances it's about being part of the family and and it feels like it's my new home and and I've got on so well and I've been a DTFC supporter since August 2019 when we played against Untar 3-1 win in, in the friendly match and 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 it made me feel very welcome and it feels so special and it's and it's and it's because I got on like I get treated very, very well and I I just really enjoy going to the games with DTFC so much. And I can yeah, see yeah. well, I've seen like part of some of the videos and I've seen in fact, didn't DT himself give you a shirt as well? Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. I was I was on I was on the coach where we where we travelled on, on the team coach because I before the Blood Brothers Cup final, DT messaged me on Instagram and said, I've got the invite to travel on the DTFC team coach to get to Nando's for a pre-match meal. And I, I, didn't, I didn't expect that. And then DT said, make sure you meet the lads at 3 p.m. at Harlow Town. And I didn't know what's happening at 3 because the, game's, the game was on in the evening at quarter to eight, I think it was. And then DT said, meet us at 3 p.m. at Harlow Town. And when I got to Harlow Town, and then I just saw a little coach there, and then and then I got to go on the team coach. It feels so privileged to be part on the DTFC team coach when we went to Nando's. And what's really special, it made me feel so happy. And DT holding the new DTFC home shirt with kit lock on the front. Because I was wearing my old black top with the old one, the, the old home top, when I was wearing nearly two years ago. And then and then DT gave me the new home shirt and it brought me a massive smile. And it's <laughs> it, I didn't expect it. It was absolutely brilliant. It was a, it was a it was a most amazing moment. And and especially went went to Nando's for a pre-match meal. And the meal was really, really nice. And then then we got the 
team coach back into Harlow Town and then and I was really buzzing for the final and I was really hoping that we're going to absolutely beat AFTVFC in the final because they're my rivals, AFTVFC. And then I was, and I was really hoping that my team DTFC beat AFTVFC in the final because I was so excited. And I'm and sure they during did. The match, they? Sorry? I said they're sure they did. They did as well, didn't they? They beat them quite convincingly in the final. I remember it very well. Yeah, during the match in the Blood Brothers Cup final, we had more supporters of DTFC. And, and I've never expected a much louder crowd and the larger crowd. And they, they all came to join me behind the goal because we normally stand behind the goal where our team DTFC attacked towards the goal at my end in the first half. And then we switched ends in the second half because, again, in the second half where the team DTFC attacked towards the goal, which where we normally stand behind the goal when we attack towards the goal where I was standing. But I never expect that much more crowd. It was absolutely unbelievable. And I, and I was so proud to lead the DTFC support in the Blood Brothers Cup final. And, it, and there was another DTFC supporter said to me, James, you've done absolutely superb to lead the DTFC support. And... And then since when we went 1-0 down against AFTVFC, I thought, oh, no, not again. Not, not like the league game in the 1-0 defeat like, or something like that. I thought, not again. And then and I just kept saying to myself, just keep believing. We will come back to this. And then we scored the equaliser. And then, <laughs> this is really funny, in the second half when we scored the fourth goal, and the funniest bit i ever seen is when... After Claw got sent off by, by the referee, and then Claw's a nice man. I've met him before, and he's, he's a really nice chap. We, be, we, be, we became good friends before the game, but we became enemies in the cup final when, on the match days because, like, we because we play against each other in the cup final. And but, like, when we scored the fourth goal, and Claw got Jay, sent Jay, off Jay, by the Jay. referee. Hey, I don't want to ruin it for too many other people because they might want to still watch it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, but you're getting a lot of love in, in, it, in the chat as well. Like Jake Smith saying, good on you, James. Keep up the great work, sir. Um, you've got Thanks. Kurt Smith as well. He's saying, love James. Miss him cheering me on. Fantastic supporter. Really inspired me to get out and do some running after watching his videos during lockdown. But again, you're getting a lot of love. And, and one thing I'm meaning to ask you as well, who would you say is your favourite DTFC player? If you only could pick one, though, only one. One. It has to yeah, be Kieran one. Hipgrave because he's a very talented player and he scores some really good goals and he's very skillful. And especially, I, I remember that game against Chigwell Town in that 3 1 victory. Now, that was that free kick from Kieran. That was an unbelievable goal and it was absolutely brilliant. Does it help that he's the boss's son, though? Yeah. <laughs> what, about, um, what about Alex Paraskeva? What do you think of him? Alex, number um, nine. He's a, yeah, he's a good player and he, he's done pretty well. And, and everyone plays really, really well. And it's absolutely unbelievable. And we have a really good team. And... And I'm just so proud to be part of the DTFC family. And do you, do you remember on, on and um, off the pitch? Do you remember Kurt Smith from Whitton, who's left you a message on here? He's left you a message saying that he misses you. Do you remember him, Kurt? Looks like Kurt, looks like one of the big. Oh yeah, I remember Kurt Smith when he. Yeah, I remember <laughs> Kurt Smith when he uh, used to play for Whitton Town, and he's he's a, he's a good player as well. And I think he plays for. Basildon United as well, I think. No, he did. He used to. No. He plays for me now. He plays for me now. Bishop oh, he Stalford plays for Swift. you now. Yeah, he plays for Bishop Stalford Swifts. That's going to be your next club as well. You're going to be when um, I'm going to I'm going to buy you off of DT. I'm going to phone DT after. <laughs> I'm going to put a transfer <laughs> request in. <laughs> I'm going to be on. I'm going to find you. I'm oh yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I remembered. I remembered Broads. I, I was on live with Broads on Instagram a long while ago. <laughs> it's just so funny. 
Broads had said to me on Instagram Live a long while ago, and then Broads has turned around and said to me and said, James, how about a £10 million to get to AFTVFC as a new <laughs> AFTVFC supervisor? I said, no, no, I would <laughs> never, ever go to AFTVFC in any kind of money what they offer me to go to AFTVFC. No way. Because DTFC is in my heart and blood. So not even for £10 million? No. 20 No. 30 <laughs> No. 40? <laughs> no, no, not any amount of money what Broads has given me an offer to support AFT, BFC. No way. <laughs> last offer, last offer. £50 million pounds to go and support anyone else. Not even AFTV, anyone else but from DTC. This is Stalford Swifts. This is Stalford Swifts. Million. £1 million. Pounds. <laughs> not really, I'm giving 50. No. Wow. No. <laughs> That's quality. Well, you, well. you must feel you must feel really special over there, James. It's um, it's yeah, really good. It have, feels really. It's really good to have someone like you supporting um the club who's follow you home and away, and you know you always bring a smile to the players' faces, and it's good. I used to watch your videos when um after the games at Whitton when the players used to come along, come behind the goal and shake your hand and give you a high five and stuff like that. That was um, so that's good. Yeah. The bit about Whitton Town, like I, I used, to, I used to go to the games a lot. Whitton Town, and I remember the game against Coggeshall Town in the one 0 victory. My passion is so high of my support, and then since, since Whitton Town made it one 0 and then I was celebrating like mad behind the goal because we got got quite a lot of support. At Whitton Town behind the goal, I was sprinting to the corner flag behind the barrier because you know the barrier that stops the spectators. Going in like a barrier for these yeah. spectators, and I've managed to celebrate where the players by the the corner flag, and then and I've jogged back to where I was standing behind the goal, and there was the other Whitton Town fan went turned around and said to me, saying, "James, go back to where you were," or something like that, and I just just totally ignored it and just focused, just keep being myself. Really, it's just like um. It's just people need to understand my passion that I love so much. But but with DTFC and the DTFC supporters, they, they treat me a lot better. And we got on really, really well at the DTFC games. We sang together and we we got on so well as DTFC fans behind the goal. Like a few of my f- new friends like Keegan, Tom, Jamie and Will. And we got on really, really well at at the DTFC home games, and there wasn't a problem at all. We we got on so, so well. Now, James, I've got to ask you something. I've seen you in the flesh at a couple of these DTFC games, and I always hear you, but because I'm on the other side of the pitch, I don't hear you clearly. So, talk me through some of these chants, because I know you've got a couple of chants. I know you have, for sure. So, talk me through some of these chants that, you're, that you've got for DTFC. What, what should I do a chant? <laughs> Yeah, why not? Yeah. Give us a good chance. Yeah. yeah, I've got a song for Kieran Hitgrave. He goes oh, like, man. there's only one Kieran Hitgrave. There's only one Kieran Hitgrave. Walking along, sing a song. Walking in the Kieran Wonderland. <laughs> and I've got funny. another one. That's quality. And then there was another one. It goes like, ah, 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 <laughs> what are you like at freestyling? Are you any good at freestyling? Like, if I was to, if DT was to phone me up and say, Bill, come and sign for DTFC next season, because he, I know that he really wants me to anyway, um, <laughs> what would be your song for me, for Billy Cove? What would be your song? What if you was, like, what if you was like the DTFC player or something? Or Yeah, number 10, goal scorer extraordinaire. I'm um, just trying to think of a song song for you, like bit. Um, I try, I try to think of a song, like it's, it's 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 sometimes it gets me a lot to remember all the songs for the players, and or I, I could do like Covey's on fire or something like that. Yes, yeah. yes, Covey, Covey's on fire. Co- on, Covey, that's one. Covey's on fire or something like that. Yes, I'd like you to sing that. 
Yeah, and, I, and I've got to do the songs for the DTFC <laughs> staff as if well, I like, for DT... like the coaching staff as well. If I sign for DTFC, I would I would actually play in one game for DTFC, like a charity game, and if you sing that song, if you sing that song for me when I play, that's a deal. What? And DT will be all over that deal as well. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll do a song like, like if you was a DTFC player, I'll definitely do a song for you if, if you play Brilliant. for DTFC. Yeah, cool. Uh, Kurt's just said as well, he says he never he never forgets the game against Lewis FC. Oh, hold on, another one. He's, oh, yeah. Never forget the game against Lewis oh, FC. Uh, they had 300 fans and James oh, outsung them all. It was fantastic. Oh, yeah. I've just seen the one from Peter. Peter, you're a bad man, you know. <laughs> He's gone. I'm not it's even reading it. Really wow. Wow. Out of order. Wow, that's out of order. Yeah. That is out of order. That's the uh, last time I helped him out as well. That's the last time oh, I helped him out. Wow. Peter, man. That's outrageous. Well below the belt, that one. Sorry, what was that to Kurt's one? Sorry, quickly. Yeah, Kurt. No, Do you remember the game against Lewis? F against Lewis FC? James? Yeah, I've remembered it. it was that 1-1 draw in the Ryman Premier Division after Whitton Town promoted from the Ryman Division 1 North in 2014 in May and that was the first ever playoff final win. It was it was hosting at the home at the home ground in the 3-0 victory against Harlow Town and and that was a memorable night which I'd never forget. It was like in May 2014. And, and and I remember I went out one night celebrating Witten Town's promotion and and that was a memorable night down at, like celebrating in Chelmsford and it was a really, really good night. And that was that was several years ago when Witten Town got promoted to the Ryman Premier Division for the first time ever in the club's history. I can't believe you actually remember the date, the date as well. That's a that's yeah, a lot of fan. people were saying to me, like, because obviously I've got autism and learning disabilities. Yeah. A lot of people have been saying to me, how has this guy remembered all the football results in all those years and, and all those, like, yeah. dates? And how, how does he remember all the results? But, but I have a yeah, classic amazing. memory on, on football results. And especially I have lots of experience on travelling independently to get to the right destinations without fail. And because my autism doesn't affect me at all on my travelling independently, and did it, and I've learnt it really, really well, and and I, and I did so well, and it, it really helped me travel independently, and which it didn't affect me at all with for my autism. Yeah, James. Let me tell you. I know you've had a, um, you've put some messages on lately saying that um, that people have been sending you, you know, uh, horrible messages and stuff. When people when people put you down and st and say about your your passion for football and for DTFC is wrong, just ignore that, mate. Because the only reason that they're doing it is because they don't have a passion for anything themselves in their own life. That's um, just jealousy, so and to, exactly that. So it's just jealousy, and they don't like the attention that you get. Um, but you just keep doing you, okay? Because you're 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 a very talented man, um, and DTFC are very very lucky to have you. Um, supporting their club and following them home and away. Um, so yeah, be proud D of yourself. Yeah, because I'm really proud, yeah, because DTFC is my passion in my heart because I have a huge yeah. passion for the club, DTFC, as a DTFC super fan. And I've remembered, yeah. I think it was around about April when I did my first ever Insta Live video when I was doing an Instagram Live with Kieran Hitgrave and our assistant manager, Nick Jennings. And... And even there was a few people making nasty, horrible comments about me when I was doing my first live video. And I did so well to like rise above it and overcome like the fear of like when people sending me horrible comments, just just blank them out and just just keep going, keep going. And and yeah. and like the DTFC lads said, they always got my back and and they said if I have any problems, I'll have a good chat with them. And so they and they always help me and. Like, if yeah. I have any problems, just have a chat with them. And just like the lad said, just ignore the few haters and stuff and just focus on the, on the vast majority of people that love my Insta Live videos and my passion for the club, 
of my DTFC support as a DTFC super fan. Exactly that, James. You are a super fan, and um, obviously we've got other guests waiting to come on in the background. We really appreciate you coming on tonight. Um, no worries, like anytime. Said, just focus on focus on all the positivity, the positivity you get. Absolutely. Uh, ignore all the neg- ignore the negatives, and just keep doing you. Just be, just do you. Okay. Thank Thanks, you for mate. coming on. We really appreciate. It. We really appreciate you coming on. No, really, no worries, anytime. Take Thanks care. Thanks a lot, James. Great guest. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Oh well, what oh, a legend. man! What, what a, a load of comment. What comments? Unbelievable. Yeah, mate, he's a top of legend, mate, James Beardwell. So shout out to him. A couple more for you, mate. A couple <laughs> more chance in here. Ah, oh, Richard, we've got Billy Co. <laughs> <laughs> we got another one for Nathan Walker as well. <laughs> His name is Billy Co. Costs about a pound. Mate, what is all this? What is all this? What is this? Wait, it's just, this is the Billy Co. This abuse. This is abuse. <laughs> this is what you open up. This is. Um, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to. Um, I'm gonna have to let my battery. I'm gonna have to let my battery charger fall out again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mate. But yeah, yeah well, my, my um the song I the song I had was was quite simple. At Maidenhead, um, Maidenhead was just Billy Cove, 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 like Ian White, White, White. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> not much, not much effort. There was not much effort really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's oh. all the songs are just pretty much remixed with someone else's name. So yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Right. So next next up, we've got um a lady that's been in demand a lot lately. I in demand um, everywhere. I mean, like we're private in, demand. in our presence. We're making <laughs> a bluff. <laughs> I think she's even got her own show coming out next week. I, I saw yeah. um, earlier today, like a physio show next Friday night. Yeah, uh, go. it's good. Yeah, it's good. All right, let's bring her in. Here we go. Hey, Hi. yes, she is. Yay! Hey, how are you guys? She's got. She looks different without her mask and her hat. I, and I, I, I can't just do that. For the whole yeah, when you put your when you put your mask on, you look like you're so angry. Like, yeah. why are you always angry? <laughs> I'm, I'm from Catford. I can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing? You're right. Good, thank you. Yeah, really good, thank you. How are you both? Yeah, good. Yeah, good. I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. You've been at work today, or have you had a... to follow based on what I've just seen? So, um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's been, it's good start. please let us know as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're you're already getting some comments as well. Uh, Ali, the legend, uh, top person, such a lovely person. That's probably my mum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, I think in fact, Jamie Leggett, who we had on last week, in fact. So, shout out to you, Jamie Leggett, as well. But um, yeah. Ali, thank you for for joining us. As as Kobe said, you're highly in demand now. You're you're everywhere, out and yeah, about. Yeah, I know. I'm getting your back a bit, aren't I? Same. <laughs> 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 well, of course, in a good way. Um, but you're a physio, right? That's, that's I am great. indeed. Yes, I'm a physio. So, how long have you been doing that for? When when did you first start off? On your journey as a physio? So I've been doing this about 11, 12 years now. Um, so yeah, long time. So um, I pretty much went straight from sort of being a student into doing football and working as a physio straight from there. So yeah, I'm showing my age a little bit, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I was going to say 12 years. What did you start yeah, so when you were I'm, like I'm, seven? Yeah, I mean, um, well, I'm, 30, I'm 32, nearly 33. So yeah. Wow. wow. <laughs> you had an easy paper yeah. round. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was the first club that you got into, or was it a football club you got into, or did you go in? Yeah, by so in, um, initially I was shadowing under a gentleman called Alex Gallego. He was based down at Cray Valley. That's when I first first started, about six months. But my first club was Greenwich Borough, which is obviously no longer with us anymore. But that was my mm-hmm. first ever club, and then I went fishing with them, and then on from there. You know, I've had a few clubs since then. <laughs> yeah. Hey. So you work. You were. You obviously you work for the NHS as well. I do. Um, yeah. You've been working throughout the whole pandemic, have you? Yeah. So I've been doing the NHS. I think about uh, again about ten years. I think I had a couple of years where I was doing a bit, um, just sort of getting experience before I got my NHS jobs. 
but yeah, I've been working throughout the whole pandemic. So yeah, inter- um, a new way of working, a new different kind of patient yeah. to work with. But yeah. How are you finding it all, like working in the NHS, especially during this time as well? It's obviously, the work has increased, I assume. Yeah, so I, I work in specialist rehab. So um, I may, I'm, a, I'm actually a specialist re, um, rehab physio in elderly care. So my job mm-hmm. is basically getting people who are of the old generation back to, to, to their fitness levels after sort of hip fractures or being unwell. So unfortunately, COVID has affected them quite disproportionately, as you can imagine. Mm-hmm. So I've had a lot of work yeah. sort of long COVID symptoms, getting them back off of being quite unwell. Well, equally... We found a lot of people were not going to hospital, so they were avoiding going in, and their problems yeah. got worse at home. Had to go into A and E, and then they got into sort of a bit of problem from that point of view. And um, I think being stuck indoors all the time is never a good thing, as I found yeah. out about two weeks ago. Um, and when you're very elderly, being stuck in a very small space means your mobility and your ability to walk and your risk of falls all change. So we're getting a lot more people coming in who are being sort of become quite frail. We've gone from being completely independent going to the shops to being stuck indoors and walking about sort of 10, 15 steps every hour, which is, is nothing really. It's really sad actually yeah. that just in my in my career. I've never seen anything like it. But hopefully yeah. there'll be an end to it soon, she says. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I read about I read um uh, your interview you done yesterday and yeah. you said about when you when you um when you are back involved with football as well, it's it's a really tough it's tough to get both jobs done, like to be yeah, at work the NHS mean, and to be involved so heavily with an elite football club, a high football club. Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those things, isn't it, that you do things because you love it and you're passionate. And when you when you have passion for something, you find time for it. Um, yeah. I think yeah. that um, there's examples where sort of you finish work. I mean, I, I tend to finish work about 4.35 if I'm very lucky and nothing bad happens, as always does before you leave. And then having yeah. to drive to bump up all St Albans on a Wednesday night yeah. and try yeah. and make the meet time and, and you're praying that Dartford Tunnel is kind to you. Um, yeah. um, it, it can be tough, but I think when you have drive and passion to do those things, you, you find time and it's a, it's a chore of love, isn't it, really? Yeah, oh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah cool. so, it's fine line, isn't it, love and madness? Well, it's, it's, it's <laughs> got, yeah, it's got to be love because then you, you also added the SE Dons uh, yeah. Yeah, to your I'm CV as I, well. I have promised people, my, my, my poor friends, are long suffering, that I was going to cut back on football, and then suddenly I was at the Don. They're like, "So now you've got extra yeah. team." I'm like, yeah, I'll, and you know what? It's, <laughs> it's an opportunity I, I I couldn't turn down. You know what I mean? I think. That, yeah, of course. I think I agreed to do one game for them, which was a cup final or a semi final, and I, I was hooked instantly. And suddenly, yeah. I was there every week. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, it's a it's a massive mo- uh, roller coaster ride that you're you're on at the moment, isn't it? With SC Don's, oh, this is like a huge. Um, Worldwide known club. Yeah, I mean, do you know what it is? It's, it's. Uh, I said it in that interview. It's their enthusiasm, and it's really reinvigorated my love for football. You know, yeah. Do you know what I thought I couldn't love it anymore. There's, there's a next level to it. I think yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's a family club. I think they've got so much going on, sort of in the background. Personally, I, I think yeah. you can't help but look at them and be completely inspired by what they're doing. And these are guys from my area who, you know. Yeah, you would argue maybe they have they have no right to do it, but their drive and passion has got them to spaces where they they deserve to be there, and, and they're only going to go up, aren't they? Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. Um, they're like the goal, their goalkeepers are now a now a familiar face on Soccer AM every yeah, big G. Morning, Soccer I AM every. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've seen take someone out. This I've seen take someone yeah, out this I mean, morning. <laughs> If Joel wants a physio, he's welcome to give me a ring. Yeah. Honestly, I'm front of that queue. <laughs> he didn't even care, did he? He just come out to wipe <laughs> him out. No, do you know what? Like this home. <laughs> goalkeepers, isn't it? You've got to protect yourself. Yeah. Safe. <laughs> I tell you what, you've got to, to be a goalkeeper. You've got to have something about you as well. They're just yeah. the craziest people I've ever I've ever met. Yeah, I've so ever met. I will say though, George is one of the best guys I've ever had. Sort of in my life, honestly, yeah. I can't do enough yeah. for you. You know, yeah, he's, he's the, what, I've, what I've seen of him on YouTube and the videos and stuff like that is that he's a proper leader. Yeah, he, you know, he just leads and people follow, which is which is exactly what you need. Exactly, yeah, he's a, he's a really great guy. If you give him a ring any time of the day, he'll be more than happy to pick up the phone, give you some advice, chat you, chat, chat to you, help you out. He's yeah. a giving person. I, I can't praise him enough, you know. And all the boys are yeah, like, actually fair. You know. yeah. I've also seen a video that Essie Don's put out like during this lockdown of some, mm-hmm. some of these nasty challenges. Yeah. Uh, talk to me through some of like some of the experiences yeah. uh Essie Don's like <laughs> anyone that kind of stick out good ones of course. Uh, yeah. I hope I was lost any limbs or anything like that, but mm-hmm. memorable ones. 
Uh, do you know what? Um, Sunday league was a trial by fire for me as a physio. Um, <laughs> um, you know what? I think my, my first game for the Dons, uh, but the league game for the Dons, I remember I think I had absolutely smashed somebody from behind. And the geese didn't get off about 10 minutes. I ran on and went, are you OK? I'm, oh. and I kind of dealt with it, but it was honestly... Um, I think they like to big up the people coming for the tackle situation. Um, they play good football, I'll be fair to them. But I think um, the tackle, people, people love tackling, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> what, what it is, that, that video, that video, I watched that video yesterday. Yeah. And it's, you know, like, it's one of them ones where, um, as a football fan, as an old school football fan, you're like, oh, they can't, you can't tackle anymore. What's the matter if it's, a, it's turned into like a non-contact sport? Mm. And all of a sudden, you just see that video and you're like, Wow. Yeah, um, <laughs> I don't want to go honestly, back. I don't want to go back to them days. No, I think, oh my you know God. I, I think um, I think I did a couple of years playing, and then that was that was done for me. <laughs> I was like, I like it better when I'm not being kicked. <laughs> do you find Do you find that you're also physio for the opposition side as well when yeah. you when you're um, like firstly done? Yeah, I think you end up doing both. I think I think it's um one of those things that you know I think I have a responsibility if someone gets badly hurt to go and assist. Let's both. Sort of a Saturday and Sunday league, you know. I would never yeah. leave somebody on their own on the pitch. Same way if I was in the street instinct. walking along, someone fell over, I'd go and assist them, you know. Um, yeah. So I think, yeah, I think for the Dons, I tend to be the only person there who's who's got um, a physio degree or the, indeed a sponge or a bag or any kind of plasters. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's funny, it's because we've got um, the physio um, when I played. It was just, it was like a, it was lucky to be like probably the assistant manager with a bucket yeah. and a sponge. I'm like, just get up. <laughs> it's like, oh the old God. school Spongemen, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But now it's like, it's now it's, it's next level, isn't it? Even the coach, even the physio that we've got. Talk to us about that, because again, does this magic sponge work? What is in this sponge? Because um, again, yeah. I'm, not, I'm actually not allowed to tell you what's in the sponge. Oh, <laughs> oh God. Oh, God. Part in our physio degree, we get taught about the sponge. <laughs> oh, you got to take, imagine running like an oath or something like that. You got yeah, to take. You know what it is? It's just really cold. I think. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you throw it with enough force, it does the trick. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Little okay. bit of deep heat, little bit of freeze spray, yeah, and it's fun. I mean, it's all you need. Deep, deep heat, smarties, um, Harry Boy, whatever it takes to get them off. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when it's really uh, muddy. I'm not ever interested in running on the pitch. Then, to be honest. I probably shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I've got um I've got two I've got two questions for you as a as uh, for physio Ali, yeah? For yeah. like so one is a change that's been made and I just want to know what, what your thoughts are on it, it's the concussion substitutes. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that decision? I think two words, at last. Um yeah. I know it's only coming into the higher levels at the minute, but I think I'm so pleased to see it. I think we're. I think football is very behind in in medical terms with things like concussion, and I think that it's a it's a positive change. I think we have to be positive and take the take, take what's been brought in, and hopefully it will work. I think concussion and head injuries are such a big part of of of, of football. Sadly, you know, I think we, I mean, we saw one watching the game just before um, I came down, and there was an injury, and someone came off for a head injury. Um, I think it's so important to put players' welfare first, and I, yeah. and I you know, I, I get all the rhetoric, and I get that the people might cheat, and managers will do this in the 90th minute and get your sub on. But I, my gut instinct is, you know what? For welfare purposes, we need to have concussion subs, make sure we're keeping our players safe. It's the least yeah. we can do for them, isn't it? Yeah, of course, of course. And the next one was, um, I don't know if it's um, they're speaking about changing it, but I don't know if they will or not. But it's the it's the like the off nudge. The off-balance nudge, you know, like what Harry Kane sort of does yeah. and Lacazette does it. I used to do it as a centre forward as well to the centre half. I used to back into the centre half and let him mm -hmm. go over the top of me. But some of the some of the landings that you see now, yeah, it's it's, it's like oh, it's it's terrible. And I, and I do think they are in discussions about outlawing that sort of um, that as well. I think it'll be a good idea. I mean, when you see those landings, I watched a video actually on Twitter um, earlier today with a, um, a, a show reel of Harry Kane doing it. And yeah. I think that when you see him landing on their back in that way, you automatically think, oh, you're lucky you didn't, you didn't pop a shoulder out or yeah. even worse, a spinal injury or head injury. I think yeah. the risk is, isn't it, is that if you have pros doing that, that yeah. people follow suit and you might see it in, in sort of situations where you haven't got that support medically or people are doing it or even kids are doing it in their game. I think it's a good thing to look at because... Yeah. I get strikers or forwards, as you say, fending themselves and backing in and things like that. But there's backing in and there's dangerous play, isn't there? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you used to be able to tip goalkeepers, didn't you, when they had the ball in their hand? So things change yeah. for a reason, don't they, sometimes? Yeah. Depending <laughs> on yeah. the goalkeeper, I think you can get away with it. I don't think you can get away with it with Big G. But no, I mean, I, I, said, I think he defends himself beautifully as his physio. <laughs> <laughs> Um, got a question in here from Lee. Lee said, if an injury is really bad, how do you keep the player calm? Um, I think the key thing is, is you have to have a really good game face. Mine is this scowling face, I think, most of the time. But I think it's about you as a, as a physio staying very calm. And I think sometimes you want to scream because you see something, you see a lot of blood, you see a bit of bone sticking out and mm. your immediate response is, oh my God, this is really bad. I need to call an ambulance. But actually, if I panic, they panic. You know, it's like if you go into hospital and your surgeon's going, which leg was it again? I can't remember. <laughs> it makes you feel unnerved. Yeah. So I think the key thing is is to keep yourself calm and also keep the players around the situation calm. There's nothing worse than seeing your teammates being hurt. And if, it, if people are getting upset, it's moving away from the situation, let them go into the changing room perhaps and just take charge of the situation. It, it's, it's never easy, you know. I think it's like the kind of experience. You know, I remember, yeah. I remember, I've definitely had a few where I've had a wobble, you know, it happens. We're all human. Um, but yeah, I think the key thing is to keep calm yourself. And I think it's a big, deep breath. And then you act and, you, and let your skills and your and your abilities show as a physio, really. That's what I do. Probably not oh, right. all fun. Ali, I've got a scenario for you. So, okay. same people, 11 v 11, Billy Coe's playing up front. He pulls up. He's pretending that he's injured. He's not yeah. really injured, but he's pretending. Yeah. He gets the physio on, which is you. Yeah. What's the game plan between you two so you can kind of style it out, you know, just to kind of kill time? Okay. Um, is it the last minute? Are we winning the game? What's it? <laughs> well, trying to hold on to a 2-1 against the league rivals. Okay. So the key thing is I might run on a bit slower for a start. I'm, a, I'm not a very fast runner anyway. I might have okay. a little bit of a jog rather than a, than a slightly faster jog, we'll say, rather than a sprint. I think the key thing is is that you have to do your assessments anyway. So regardless of if I think he's milking it or not, I have to make sure that whatever part of his body is moving, I'll have a little look at, you know, have a chat with him. How are you feeling? Can you carry on? You know, can you stand on it? And then you slowly walk them off. Um, I would say refs are quite hot on it these days. <laughs> and they're very much on you. As soon as you're on the pitch, they want to get them off. Um, I think um, for me, it's always about just having a chat with him on the pitch. I mean, refs know when you're doing it, to be fair. You know when it's coming. Um, you might sub him. Who knows? I don't know. But yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised Billy lasted that long in the game. If it's what, 90th minute, we'll see. <laughs> oh, <laughs> To be fair, to be actually, to be fair, I'd usually score the hat trick and just been subbed off by them. I've got this one from Jake. Um, Have you ever had managers try to make a play continue despite they saying that you shouldn't continue? That's a good one. Short answer, yes. Um, it's always a um, an interesting debate, isn't it, between a physio and a player and, uh, and a manager. I think um, all you can do, because we're all adults at the end of the day, and I think we can all sit here and have hissy fits and throw tantrums and stamp our feet, but all you can do is give the manager the information, give the player the information, explain to them why they shouldn't carry on and mm. see where you go. Now, there have been times when I've done that and the players carry on, they've been fine, happened. Equally, there have been times when they carried on and about a minute later they've hobbled off and I've given that look of, yeah, I did tell you that would happen. But I think it's about just giving everyone information and being sure that, you know, that your your reasoning and your assessments are really sound and that, you know, so that makes sense. I think I'm quite lucky, touch wood, that most managers tend to listen to me and they tend to respect what I say. I think players do too. Um, you know, I like to think I'm quite a relaxed and I'm not, no, not, 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 I'm not the best teacher in the world, but I'm quite relaxed. I tend to try and do the right thing and make sure my decisions aren't just snapshot and having a shout. It's, it's, it's a joint discussion, you know. I appreciate it's hard when you're, you know, say your top striker suddenly got a little knock and, you know, you, you, it's a game you need to win. And you're thinking, oh, there's only 10 minutes left. Can you not just play on? But sometimes you've got to say, look, those 10 minutes might cost you three games for this player. Actually, get him yeah. off now and rest him and treat it well. I might have him back in by next game. That, that happened with, um, is it Eva Canario from... from uh, oh, Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. that, was, that was a very complicated one, wasn't it? Um, yeah. You know, it's one of the things that I, I, remember when, I remember when she first came in, I remember I looked up to her so much because I was like, one of the first sort of established female doctors in, 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 that I know of in, in football and being like, yeah, I could be like her one day. And then that happened and he went, maybe I don't want to be like that one day. Um, yeah. But basically, it's that thing, isn't it, of when a referee calls you on as a medical member of staff, I think you have to run on because you have no idea what's wrong with that player. Mm. You know, and I think that 
part of me was that um, was it was it Hazard? I can't remember if it was Hazard now. Um, it was Hazard and Marino was just obviously. Yeah, and for me, I think the blame for the player for not getting up. But um, I'm I'm biased. I'm a physio, in it, so I'm always going to blame the player for that. But I think you need. I think maybe they needed a scapegoat on that day, and perhaps she was a good scapegoat, wasn't she? Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, it's what it is. You win some, you lose some. What are you going to say, Bill? Yeah. No, I was just to say, we've got, there's a question there from that Danny G. I can't even pronounce yeah. the word. So I'll just say, yeah. tell us tell about the incident at Bristol Manor. Oh, Bristol. They oh. Love, everyone loves this story, don't they? It's like my, my biggest story. Um, yeah, basically, we had um, one of our players, uh, Reese. unfortunately, um, he had an anaphylactic reaction in the middle of a game. Um, it was quite serious. His lips swelling up and losing his airway. Um, it happened yeah. in the space of about five minutes. Um and it was frankly terrifying because I think, you know, these these situations, I was in Bristol, middle of nowhere, we have no idea. This has never happened to him before. We haven't got a pen. It is what it is. We had to call for an ambulance and wait very and wait very tentatively in the in the changing room for them to come in. He had to have two doses of um um of adrenaline basically to bring him round and to stop his airway from closing. Um, we had the defib and an airway ready to go in. In case they hadn't got there in time. Luckily, they got there quite quickly. But yeah, it's frankly terrifying, to be honest. Um, wow. I've never had, I'll be honest, it's, it's my worst, it's, it's the worst injury I hope I ever had in football. Um, basically, as he was having the reaction, we had a player sent off, and they had a player sent off, and then the ref just blew for half time and everyone went in. I'm like, no, 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 no. This is, it's, 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 it's a player just collapsed on the picnic. I need some help with this one. It was absolute chaos, to be honest. But um, yeah, it's upsetting at half time seeing all the players having t- team talk, and he's sitting there, and he can barely breathe. It's it's horrible, isn't it, when you think about it like that? You know, yeah. terrifying. Yeah. Especially when you, it's, it's the middle of Bristol. I, I mean, it's like a, it's like a physio's worst case scenario: a middle of Bristol, massive anaphylactic reaction that's, that every every twenty seconds is changing and getting worse, and you're just sitting there waiting for an ambulance, feeling a little bit like vulnerable. That's what I would say, actually. Yeah. You know, but yeah. very luckily, Reef was amazing throughout it. He 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 really worked hard to, to to sort of keep calm and to breathe with us and to listen to what we were saying. I didn't have to put an air. I mean, I'm I'm just happy I didn't have to put an airway in. I didn't have to do CPR and get at the old defib. But uh, we were pretty. I think we were pretty close to knuckle on that one. Really, we're having to do sort of emergency care. But you know, luckily someone was someone was looking out for us that day at K Wanderers. I tell you that. Yeah, well, good job. You was looking out for him as well. Yeah. <laughs> It, you know what? It's, it's why physios are there, isn't it? Um, we hope yeah. we never get used. We hope we never have to do anything. But actually, we're there for that reason. And thankfully, it's, it, it all kind of all worked out for us. And we got the ambulance there nice and quick. And they were able to help us as well. So that was really nice. It, it, it was a good outcome to a bad situation. And now, yeah. now Reese has got EpiPen that, that, that stays with him at all times. <laughs> uh, amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, what a story to finish on. Um, yeah. <laughs> That is amazing. Great insight into your... in football. <laughs> yes. <laughs> let's, hope, let's hope you don't have too many more like that. No, um, it, I mean, basically, he's learnt to graph, which is really reassuring as a physio, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But well, yeah, it's, um, <laughs> like you say, it's what you lot are there for. And uh, you're probably the unsung heroes of football, to be honest, especially of non league football. Yeah. Uh, you, don't think... get the, you don't get half the credit you deserve. Do you know what? It's not why we get into this game, though, is it? We're not here. I mean, I'd rather be quiet and be not busy and be unsung than be like yeah. the star of the show every week. Yeah, saving someone's life every week. <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, if it was like that, I'd be asking for a pay yeah. rise. I think. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. All right. Well, thanks for coming on, Ali. Thank really appreciate you. it, and good luck with your future uh, podcast career. Thank I know you, you're man. the flavour of the month I'll lately. You on that one one day? Who knows? <laughs> yes. Oh, well, I'll, I'll be flattered. I'll be flattered. I'll oh, definitely come on. Thank All right, so thank you so much for coming on. Stay safe. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Bye. Cheers, Thanks, Ellie. Bye-bye. Oh, great. Great guess. Yeah. Another guess indeed, man. Oh, and again, that story just at the end there. Anaphylactic shock. Imagine that. Well, I, you know, I didn't even, I saw it in my eyes because I don't, I need glasses. I have to wear glasses, but obviously I don't wear them because I look like an absolute com- comedy sketch when I wear them. Um <laughs> But I couldn't quite make out the word, and then when you said it, and I was like, "Oh shit!" Like this is this is bad. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh. So, yeah another good guess. Another good guess. I think we have got our next one waiting in the wings as well, aren't we? In the wings, man. Give us a little bit, bit of an intro before he comes in. I know he's been waiting, but just, you know, well, right. Jamie Richards, the Richo Nine. Right. This this boy. Um. So 
I signed for his dad. Uh, his dad was a manager late in Pennant. He signed, they signed me, played me up front with Jamie. Um, we hit it off straight away. Jamie's a fantastic player. Uh, me and him was up front. And we sort of, we, so we, 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 we done really well, to be fair. We scored a lot of goals that season. Um, we was very successful. And he's, had, he's gone on to have a really good non-league career. And he, now he's having a, a fantastic golf career. And not only that, he's just got stories for days. That he's just the funniest guy you can ever imagine to meet. Um, and what a genuinely, genuinely happy, go lucky, positive guy. You could not wish to meet another and anyone like him. There you go. I think that's, I think that's enough, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go, Jamie Richards. Oh, he's not even central. Come on. <laughs> and I get him a central. There we go. I feel like I'm sat on the bench here, Kobe. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, we never on the bench. We never on the bench. Listen, what, what, what an intro that was. Thanks for having us. Kobe, nice. Uh, no, thanks for having us. And sorry, I felt like I don't even, I'm going to be really rude. I don't even know your name. That's Clinton, mate. Don't worry. No Clinton. one. Very nice to meet you, Clinton. Thanks for having us on. And, oh, and listen, I, I was, I, I probably come on a little bit early and I felt like I was in the green room in the backstage and I was <laughs> hearing Kobe talking about biscuits. There's no biscuits in this green room, man. What's going on? Oh, unless we're on the bench, a few oranges or something. <laughs> Like the Jonathan Wolf show, isn't it? When he goes back into the green room and you see all the other guests. Green room, that's exactly what I felt like. But yeah, no, listen, congratulations with all this. And and as I was playing around, I'm I'm having a look and trying to understand what's sort of going on. So um, fair play to you. I think it's obviously in these current times, people are so used to now going on a Zoom call or jumping on a podcast. And it's great because you're getting to meet so many people and speak to so many people. And that's yeah. obviously clearly what you guys are doing is obviously sharing insights from, you know, obviously you just had a physio on from players, ex-players. I can see you've had obviously internationals on here as well. So it's great to be able to say, share them experiences. So uh, fair play to you guys and um, yeah, continue success. But thanks for having us. No Thank you, man. I should play though. Mate, you, uh, just tell us about, just, I know all about, I know about you. I know the Jamie Richards. I know Richo. Tell, tell the people that are watching about the, um, so how you started your career? Where did it all start? Well, I, I guess, I guess, like you know, my dad, my dad was obviously into his football, um, and you know, he, I, I remember as a kid, obviously going to watch him, and and my dad was obviously he had me quite young, so I felt you know the twenty year age gap that was between us, you know, I was you know probably seeing him play football as a you know as as I was a young sort of like kid and. You know, naturally, obviously wanted to sort of play um, and not always have them games of, you know, in the back garden with him. And, you know, as you do as a kid, you know, your dad's into the football. I was I was obsessed with it like any other kid. And, you know, I was around good players uh, at school and you wanted to play with better players. So I was constantly looking for that. And I lived in an area at the time where, you know, the grass, you know, in the playing fields, you'd always be over there every day. And I remember like where I used to live, like you get your mum come shouting out. Jane, your dinner's ready. <laughs> You're still like, oh, shit, I'm in the middle of a game and yeah, you know, have to sort of run home. So I, I was always sort of obsessed with, with with it. And I think being around my dad, watching him still play, manage. And I think as you just sort of mentioned in the intro, obviously pretty early on in my career, I not only got to manage to play under him, um, but, you know, and play with him in certain games as well. So, um, you know, it was vets games at the time or whatever. So, um, but yeah, I, I, you know, it's been a it's been a part of me for for a long time, and and I, I, st- I miss it very much still to this day. Um, but I still get my fix with a fe- with the vets um, once every now and then for the, for the Middlesex Wanderers. So and and, and, I, and I really enjoy when they have them games. So it was funny because I, I, sp- I spoke to my dad uh, Bill, and I said like, um, you know, I, I'm um, I'm on. You've invited me onto this sort of um, onto this this podcast, and. Um, and he went, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What a player. He went, two great feet. He went, he was very composed in front of goal. Great in the air. He went, but what a lazy trainer. <laughs> <laughs> you sure he said trainer? <laughs> yeah, trainer, yeah. When he turned up. <laughs> when he turned up. Oh. Yeah, yeah. No, I'll tell you, I was the worst. I was the worst trainer. I was the worst, worst trainer. When, especially, especially at that point, when I played reviews, um, your dad I was I'll tell one day I think I turned up at training one night and I pretended I lost my boots so I just couldn't be bothered I just and I've lost my boots <laughs> Mate, that, that's, no, that's no lie as well that's Clint that's no lie that was definitely and I guess I guess that's where we probably hit it off because as I said my dad's giving that obviously you know 
show her of what he was like and, and and i was just a runner really i've done all his running and sort of like made sure that you know he was there we had someone there to sort of finish it but no he's he um, i think he hit the nail pretty much on the head hit the nail on the head with um harry this has got described you and you know yeah, i think uh, what what a great season really as well back then like what a, you know when i when i think back at football that's what i miss that sort of camaraderie yeah. that banter we'd have obviously in the changing rooms you know and i think yeah. I've been fortunate enough to play in some great teams, but, you know, the teams that always stick out in my head are the ones that, you know, where we had that change room and that sort of, that group of players that wanted to sort of fight for each other, be around each other. And, and I, listen, I was a bad trainer, really. I didn't really like training, wanted to play the games more than anything. Didn't like yeah. all the technical sort of stuff and you go again, but wanted to play in the games because I was competitive. But, you know, that club, you know, when we was at Pennant, I'll never forget it. It was like, what, you know, so many characters... I couldn't yeah. wait for training. Couldn't wait for a Tuesday and Thursday to get around the boys. And then obviously we'd go out, have that bit of banter after. And, you know, that's, that's stuff that I miss and, you know, big time, really. Um, it, weren't so, as, it weren't as nice as it is now, though, was it, over Wadham Lodge? They ain't got, they've got all the free g pitches over there now. We was training on, like, a, a cabbage patch with no, fun, with no yeah, light. Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> well, fair enough, we played, it, yeah, we played, um, I played a game um, for, for, for the Wanderers over there not so long ago against... Um, all the, like, the ex-Arsenal boys, like Johnny Fortune, um, Paolo Vanazza, um, yeah. I can't remember. There's a load of numbers. We played on that 3G pitch, and I couldn't believe how much change has obviously gone on over there. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, no, listen, I, 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 that was what a great year. And I think we just missed out, I think, didn't we, of, of, of the playoffs that season. Yeah. And I don't yeah, think yeah. Was, that was probably because you weren't there from the start of the season. Had you been there from the start of the season, we might have been all right. <laughs> Sorry about that, mate. Yeah. <laughs> Where was you then, Kobe, at the start of the season? Was he still out partying? Um, I think I was at East. I think I was at East Farrock, um, ah. and then I and then I had a bit of bother. I had to go and do a few things, and then I came and signed for, for Jamie's dad. How old are you now, Kobe? How old would you be now? I'm 43 now. 43. Okay, yes, yeah, so yeah. You're a few years older than me. I'm 40. So yeah, I remember you sort of coming in, and it was like, yeah, I, I would have been probably pretty young. When we sort of played yeah. then, you would have been relatively young, sort of back then. But um, yeah, it was quality. It was a really good season. Some of the, like you say, the camaraderie in that. Sometimes with the away trips, we wouldn't even want to get off the coach. coach. We had to be there in such a lot. We was like, I can't. We're in. Are we like, no, fuck that. We're standing on this. Ken, Ken, there was there was this one play, Dave Bastian, and he was a school teacher, and he and, and he and he used to turn up on his moped every session for training, and you know every session we'd do something to him, we'd put stuff in his moped, we'd put boot polish around the inside of his helmet, yeah, you know, and he'd get home and he'd take his helmet off. And like he had all this boot push, but every game he used to take the brunt of everything. And I'll never forget the end of the season, we're all on this coach, and it was his like payback time. And he'd done us all. You know, we, 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 I can't remember who it was we played, but we got off the, we got on the coach, and it was like, you know, everyone's sort of starving, wants their bit of food, like on the coach. You know, boys, um, I've treated you today, I've got like a load of food for you. And he had all these sort of like sausages and, you know, chicken fires, all these little bits of food, you know, and we'd have these games at the back of the bus and he'd just sit there, opened them all up and everyone fired into this bit of food. And within like seconds, everyone was going, oh, 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 oh what's happened, what's happened? And he basically syringed every bit of food with this amazing <laughs> sanity sauce. And you literally only have like a touch of it in your mouth and it was on fire. He ruined us. Last game of the season, Dave Bastion. He was a, he was a winner. But um, yeah, listen, I still, he still plays now. So it's like, it's them days. You know, when it was people's birthday, Kobe, used to sort of come in there and cake them and, you know, in the showers and ruin them. You know, listen, that was, it was a great team. Um, and I think, as I said, like for me, that's the one thing that sticks out for me. Over cool. like you know my career is you know is is them sort of them seasons where you had that sort of banter and you know that Ben Cooper Ben Cooper's still playing Ben Cooper he's played against this I mean we well I say a few months ago I can't remember when it was now lost track of days months years but yeah really? we played against who's, Bucker Steel who's played he playing Bucker for now Steel. he's playing over Bucker Steel oh really yeah he's, he's mate he was he was like Perlo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I'll never forget. I think it was Horsham away. He went on that run, went round about twelve play players. I think he come from his own box and scored. He didn't play many games, and he was sort of always like you know in and out of the sort of side. But um, 
yeah, it, you know, obviously me and him, he was like one. It was funny because I only spoke to him the other day and he said, like, he said, do you remember when we were playing for Pennant and um, the bus would meet out at the top of the road and we'd come dressed a pair of us in like, like a couple of <laughs> bears. <laughs> Whatever it was, having a tear up. Like on the road, everyone was bibbing like, what are these two bears having a proper <laughs> tear? <laughs> We're filming it. It's like, I think, yeah, some of the things we used to get, turn up in the games with like the old the music box to Eminem on the back of the van. Like, <laughs> so tell us about tell us about the roller skate story. Oh, the roller skate story. <laughs> we, um, well, I was playing for Braintree at the time, and I don't know if you know Brentwood Services. Um, Dave Culverhouse was the manager, and it was my I think it was my second spell at the club. I sort of left Braintree, I think, go to St Albans, and I came back. Um, and and it sort of Bradley Quinton was the was the um, was the was the captain, and I got on well with Bradley, and they was kind of struggling really a little bit. Um, the manager got sacked, so he come in, and it was almost like you're trying to get that bit of that bit of camaraderie, get a bit of morale sort of going, and you know it was always this meet at, um, at Brentwood Services. So I like, you know, as I sort of done, sort of took from like the pennant days of, you know, turning up on different outfits. So I sort of like, you know, I said to Bradley on the coach, I said, listen, let me know when everyone's on the coach and I'll, and, and, and I'll come. I said, but make sure all the boys see me as I'm coming along the sort of road and I'm telling him where to, what's, what are you up to? What are you doing? Anyway, I don't know if you know Brentwood Services, but on the corner there used to be like a little chef and I'm in the back car park of the little chef completely naked and I've got a pair of elbow pads knee pads I've got a crash helmet I've got me bag on me back and these plastic like blades <laughs> roller blades anyway anyway I've said right he's called me he went Richard we're waiting for you where are you I went, well, just have a look out the uh, window, tell the boys. Anyway, as, as I've come driving along, I can hear them all roaring. They're jumping down. They're screaming out the window. But as it, as it, as it, as I, just as I get to the entrance, there's a police car. It goes <laughs> past me. I hear the sirens go. <laughs> he spins round. <laughs> and just as I go into the car park, he pulls me over. <laughs> And now I am in all my glory. I've got my elbow pads, my knee pads, my bag on my back. Anyway, pulls me over. The two coppers jump out. Now this time all the boys are roaring, taking pictures. And this is before, like, really social media or whatever as such. But anyway, the chairman at the time comes over. And now I'm, like, I'm trying to get all my clothes out of my back. And this is the best bit about it. There's police officers, you know, and he's, like, one of them's really angry. The other one's kind of sort of, like, seeing the joke inside of it. And um, this this one goes to me, like, give me one reason why I don't do you for an indecent exposure. I said, look, mate, I said, look, we're bottom of the league. I said, like, please, like, let us try and, like, a bit of team morale. I've turned up a bit late. But he went, I'm being serious. He went, gish your name. So, like, all the chairmen's going, no, 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 like, calm down. Gish your name. So I went, like, Jamie Richards. And this time I've just got me, like, my pants on pretty much. And I've got me elbow pads, my knee pads. He went, he went, right, where do you live? Uh, where was your address? And at the time, I was living in Wanstead. But Wanstead from Brentwood, right, obviously it's quite a far away. There's M25, there's A roads and a lot. And he went to me, and this police officer looked at me, and he went, you mean you've come all the way from Wanstead to Brentwood? <laughs> well, as he said that, I've laughed. His police officer, mate, has basically spat almost like out laughing. <laughs> And he went, and, and, and he made himself like look silly, really, I guess, to some extent. And I said, no. Nah. I said, I've just come from the little chef. <laughs> and he went, oh. uh, and he, anyway, the chairman sorted it out. Anyway, we went to, I'll never forget, it was Basingstoke away. And, um, you know, I, I know I scored a couple of goals, but then I got sent off. And I think we lost 3-2. And, 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 and the, um, the Gazette or whatever, the local non-league paper, the non-league daily or whatever it used to be called, it went... In the headlines, it was Richo goes from villain to hero to villain because I got nicked, I scored, and then got set up. So I still have the article now. But yeah, listen, it's not best thing. <laughs> yeah, all, all, all the fun and affair. But again, I, I I never forget like Braintree, like, I, I, and I don't know why. I think obviously you just mentioned Ben Cooper, but me and him together was a nightmare. Nights out, we was always getting dressed yeah, up, yeah. just sort of like. 
some of the things. But I used to turn brain tree. I used to sort of like score a couple of goals. And I always had in the boot of my car, you know, different outfits. You know, if I scored a goal, I'd come in as Batman into the like into the bar after. You know, <laughs> or if I scored a couple of goals, it'd be Superman. <laughs> you know, and it, it, it was just stupid, stupid things. But yeah, that was I suppose. A bit of my what character. About the, what about the zebra? I remember I used to have some zebra print trousers. <laughs> zebra print um, trousers. Yeah, that's, that's it. You remember them, don't you? Nobody in Essex has got pants like mine. <laughs> Dancing about in them. But, yeah, listen, I, I suppose that little bit of character. And well, I, I guess, I guess I, you know, looking back on it, you know, and how I sort of, you know, look, you know, now I'm involved in golf being a singular sport. It was sort of almost like, you know, bringing that sort of camaraderie. And I, and I remember winning like that or getting promoted of Boreham Wood, you know, and, I, and I've got the video on my phone and I sort of look back here and, you know, first thing, like Ian Allenson was my manager at the time. Um, and the first thing he says, like, as we've won the league, you know, in the change room, all serious, he says, James, like, you know, the, what you've done for this club and the changing room, you know, bringing the guys together, having that laugh, that togetherness and, and I guess that's all I sort of really sort of meant to try to do from some of that antics was feel a part of it because I'm not going to lie, Bill. I said, I, I think, you know, now as I've got older, probably I, I'm not putting myself down, but never felt that I was the greatest of players, but wanted to try so hard and bring so much to the team. Maybe there was a bit of insecurity there where I wanted to sort of bring that togetherness and people to have that bit of banter and that bit of laugh. And I think... That's ultimately sort of what it was about for me. And I think when now I could be around people that would almost bounce off of that sort of, you know, um, mentality, I think that's when I got the most out of players and players got then the most out of me, really. I, I, and as you know, as a manager, you know, bringing it back to the seriousness side, you know, I, I was fortunate to play on some good managers and the ones that made me feel, you know, felt like a good player, good man managers, they got the best out of me. And the ones that didn't mind that, they understood what I was trying to do. And it weren't, you know, I weren't doing it when we was losing 4-0. You know, it, you know, I, I I would obviously curb it then. But it was just to bring that, you know, people want, the boys wanted to have a night out. They wanted to stay later after training to sort of have that banter. And I think that's so important, you know, when you're playing in a team and, and, and being around, you know, or looking to sort of achieve more. Because, you know, that that's definitely... What I take now and obviously t into sort of like, you know, the work I do now with golfers being in a singular sport, they don't have that. But, you know, in a singular sport, it's, it's very lonely. You can be sort of, you miss that sort of social side of things and it's different. So yeah, yeah. we've built like a team now in professional golf and, you know, where we, you know, we're there to achieve and, you know, do the best we can. And that no greatness, I don't believe, is achieved like singularly. It's when you're a part of a team. And I always give the... The analogy in in, um, in golf um, regarding football, because in football it doesn't matter if you play Sunday morning Premiership. You know you've got a manager, you've got a chairman, you've got a coach, you've got a physio, you've got that support around you, and you've got a lot of other teammates. Professional golfers don't have that, so I guess I understood the importance, like, and I understand it more now. What I was trying to do and get out of, you know, teams that I was involved with. So. Um, and that's where you know it weren't all about silliness because every time I went on that pitch, mate, rolled my sleeves up, I gave my all, and you know, but yeah, so people remember them stupid stories. Was we had Ben Cooper, Neil Tilly, Sam Underville, Matty Waldron, Jay Notley, you know, um, with some big names there, so you. Uh, you obviously you rightly you say it yourself. He wasn't the best player in that squad, but I was, I'd think you'd say he was the main player. He was the most important player because you made us tick, and you were a manager's dream. You're a manager's dream. You were. Well, you was. <laughs> you, know, what, what, uh, you know. Listen again. Like I'm not to sort of like as I said. I knew what my my abilities were. You know, and as I said, I, the best pl managers got the most out of me when they they'd make me feel like that person. Go and do like run around or. It, gave me the captaincy. You know, I remember being the captain at most of the clubs that I pretty much played for. And that was what drove me because I did feel like that leader or like that wanted to be like, I wanted it. I, they knew that I wanted it so bad every time I won that pitch. And I just wanted to make sure that everyone else did it. And if we did win, we'd, we'd celebrate in that way. Um, and obviously, you know, that had hurt me. I couldn't go home. And a bit like my dad, passionate, you wear your art on your sleeve. And it was like, I know with my dad, you know, as a manager, he couldn't sleep of a night, you know, during the week, what his team selection was going to be. 
you know, and, and even though he was my dad, he weren't like the most like vocal. I think he was very sort of sensible in the dressing room, but he would still go around individually and put his arm around a player, go and express yourself, you know, you know, run around, you know, and, and there was never, he never sort of picked me up, but it was just that honest sort of feedback, you know, and he'd tell me if I had a bad game, tell me if I had a good game. And I think I've always respected his opinion in football because it was never sort of one, are oh, you brilliant, son? Different class, mate. Like today, brilliant. Well, you know, there was that truth. Thought you could have done a little bit more there today, or think you could have passed that, or you know. And I, and I, I, I fall back on, and I think, yeah, that's one thing I always knew that I put myself about, you know. And uh, and that was, yeah, what probably why I got, you know, into most of the teams that I did. Um, so yeah, you played for some fantastic clubs. Um, in your career, a lot of really big non-league clubs. Um, out of all the clubs that you played for, who is your best strike partner and why have you chosen me? <laughs> <laughs> do, 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 but, 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 Bill, do you know what? And, and, and I sort of, it's, when, when you sort of like, you know, put it like that or, I, you know, I look back at it now and I played with some unbelievable players that have come out of the league getting paid a lot more money uh, or big na names that have been signed. And I think as a strike partner, you can only sort of like, you know, go with who you hit it off with the most for me, you know. And, you know, when you had successful seasons, if I scored 30, 40 goals in a season, which I had them seasons, you know, it was like... Why? Because I weren't really a big, big goal scorer, if you know what I mean. And I played with the big goal scorers. But there, there is definitely players that stick out in my head. And, you know, I think, again, probably the ones where I had them great seasons. You know, I played for Fisher. I remember winning everything with Fisher Athletic. You know, Steve Watts, Leroy Griffiths, some of the best, like, big names in non-league football. But, you know, yourself obviously did stick out but I've got to say like James Bunn I played with a couple of like a couple of teams with and he was full of ability and I think we sort of like partnered very sort of well but then Adrian yeah. Allen you know at Chelmsford when I played with him you know yeah. another one that we just seemed to hit it off and I enjoyed playing up front with him you know whatever yeah. that was so you know I, I do think that you know we, I've been fortunate to play with some great players you know I can name some unbelievable players but just ones that stood out for me that I remember, you know, and even going back to sort of like Enfield, and I think I think of it more them players where I enjoyed it and had my best times because I worked sometimes, you know, some of the better clubs that I played at with, you know, probably weren't good enough to play up front because of the Lee Wargris and Steve Watts. So I played wide right, you know, because yeah. I had that engine to sort of go up and down and, you know, um, or, you know, if one of them weren't in, then I'd go and play up front with them sort of thing. So, um, but yeah, I, I guess, you know, it, it's a, that's an R one for me. But yeah, listen, it, I'm not just saying it. That season stuck out for me when me and you played up front. And I think we did complement each other well because, you know, you was that natural finisher, you know, and probably needed me to do a bit of that running. So, you know, and that was, that was quite successful <laughs> in that sense. Oh, uh, quality. See, that, when you find your, like, you know, as you say, like, when you find happiness and camaraderie, it just, it, it just works for you, doesn't it? So I know you found it at Enfield Town as well. And I loved my time at Enfield Town. Um, the, the fans, the committee, it, you know, just everything about the club I fell in love with. And I had I, probably one of my most successful seasons there, although I was coming to the end of my career. Yeah. You know, a top goal scorer. I was, you know, I was just, it was amazing. Player of the year. I loved it. I loved them. Yeah, well, that was that was actually my last season of playing football. You yeah, know, I probably was about 35 or whatever. You know, Borgy, um was the manager. Bradley Quinton was helping him out. And they called me up. I was done, really, from football. And he went, yeah. James, like, you know, we're in bottom of the league pretty much. We've got 22 games of the season. And literally, I want you to come in and pick these players' heads up. And I was like don't want me as a good player then like sort of like to score a few goals just to bring that laugh. <laughs> but, but, uh, I guess I kind of knew that and like listen I was starting most games and like what well, I played every game but we went from bottom of the game, every game was like a cup fire and I still got videos on my phone now you know of what that season meant and it was like you know whether it's the fans I look back and I enjoyed playing when there was a few fans like the Harlows of the world Chelmsford when I played for them and you had that bit of a like rapport with the fans, and that that was what sort of spurred me on and wanted me to sort of like 
push on and sort of like give my most because listen, everyone wants a bit of a, you know, a G up and, you know, and, and, and maybe, you know, when it was the bigger games, I wanted it so bad, tried so hard. It, it just didn't happen for me. You know, a bit like yeah, sort of yeah. uh, the golf where, you know, if you try so hard, it don't always happen. So, um, uh, for me, yeah, that, you know, Enfield Town, that, that, that season, when we stayed up, I think it was like last game of the season, we managed to stay up. Brilliant season for a different reason, because I've never been in really necessarily in a relegation battle, you know, yeah. but it was every game meant something rather than just being an also ran through the middle of the season where games didn't matter. And it was, you know, the old megaphone would come out after, we are staying up and, you know, if I come off in a game, I'd get behind in the stands with the fans banging the drum. You know, and it was that I know that that was a big part, you know, of obviously what ultimately did get us over that line. You know, not not yeah. say my ability, you know, because we had like you know a, a great squad of players, but it was that sort of like if it went from sort of you know a bit dead in the change rooms, bottom of the league, everyone's heads are a little bit down. It does need that sometimes, and I'll never forget. I need you in the change room to sort of like get these boys going, and plus. You know, you're a good player. So, that, you know, they definitely stick out for me, them, them sort of like, them seasons, you know. They meant something. They meant something. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Well, you've been getting loads and loads of comments, mate. Um, you've been a very Actually, popular yeah. guest. Uh, you'll see them when you uh, when we watch it back. They'll all pop up on the side. And Ricky got, Christ, is he on there? Uh, you've got oh, Colin Ginger, Ginger Alpin. Colin Alpin's the dead one. You've got Colin Shane Alpin, Bambler, yeah. said, Said Richo and Steve at Bournemouth, funniest duo ever. Can he oh. teach his brother Charles to play golf properly? <laughs> <laughs> you got, um, Steve-O. That, that, see, that was, again, Boreham Wood, you know, Steve-O. What a great character. And obviously, he's gone on and like he's doing bloody yeah, yeah. unbelievable with his social media now. But, like, again, yeah. I'll never forget, you know, him. He, he was proper. He was like a double act. He was a double act, wasn't he? We he was were. <laughs> Listen, we were. And I've got some great material on my phone from back in the days. But again, like, I wouldn't necessarily say it was the best team that I ever played in, but we got promoted to that, you know, Ryan Prem that season. We won in the playoffs, but it was, yeah. it was such a sort of great season. And he was a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant character. And it was like, you know, that people enjoyed going to training, you know, to sort of like have the laughs with us and have all the different, there's so many different characters um you know in that team and and you know when when you've got that sort of bit of camaraderie people want to fight for each other you know you knew the arguments that people meant like you know they they've got that passion they want to you know why because we'd have them arguments in the change rooms amongst each other and whatever else you know and that, and that is what like, for me that's what it's all about do you know what i mean you're turning up you know and i remember playing in some clubs drive miles away get paid decent money some of the best money i'd ever got played for this club and I won't necessarily say who, but like, you know, people were just there to pick up their money. They weren't like, and they're coming forever. They didn't really care or want it enough, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I didn't yeah. enjoy that. Didn't enjoy it. Yeah. That's why I love playing under contract. I love playing Sunday morning football. Sorry, Kobe, you go on. Yeah. I'll chat for hours. You probably got <laughs> someone else waiting in the room. Yeah, we've got, well, yeah, we've got Jamie. We've got, he's waiting how you was. We've got Jamie Curriton waiting uh, in the background. Um, no, so it's not a bad one. It's not a bad one to follow. No, listen, I remember him, he, he, him as well. So, listen, thanks very much for having us. I've really enjoyed like being and having a laugh, and it's good to see. Listen, he's like the rag and bone man, and here in a COVID with the old beard going He just needs a few tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> no, oh, listen, Ken, good to see you, mate. Uh, nice to meet you. Thanks for having us. And, um, thanks for coming on, mate. We'll, get, we'll definitely get you back on again, mate, because we'll have to do some more talking and less laughing. Yeah, listen, I'm all in. I'm all in. Oh, Thanks man. very much. Right, Have a enjoy the rest of your weekend, chaps, and um and you, I'll speak to you soon. Cheers, Cheers, Cheers. 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 Bye bye bye. Bye bye. Oh, oh mate. What a character. He could we could, he could do his own show, seriously, with some of the stories. That oh, won't even laugh at it. Oh no, let's get Jamie straight in there. Jamie. Hey, Jamie, Jamie you're right. you waiting, mate. Sorry ah, to that's you right. I was enjoying him. He's he's a funny <laughs> guy, isn't he? I was enjoying the chat. It's good. Oh, he's a proper character. Proper character. So from one Jamie, from one goal scoring Jamie to another, really, <laughs> um, what a legend you are! Uh, ah, and that, I know you're obviously in the um, you're, you're in non-league now at Enfield. Mm. Um, so tell us about obviously everyone's going to know about you, um, your career because if you don't, then obviously you've been living under a rock. Um, 
over a thousand games, you know, three hundred over three hundred fifty goals. What I found out today as well, there's only twenty you're you're one of twenty nine people in the whole world mm. that's achieved that. That's yeah. unbelievable. I didn't know until I'd done it. So I, I knew that, that it, obviously it was a big deal, but yeah. you sort of think that there's gonna be more people than than that. So that in the end made it a lot more special. Once I knew that yeah, one of sort of under thirty people in, in the world of football. Yeah. yeah, made it made it real special. So Unbelievable. So I made it um off my last count was twenty one clubs. Is that about right? Or is it I think it's right. I've played for a few twice. So I think sometimes yeah. when you if you don't read them properly, it just have a list yeah, of teams, yeah. it look about thirty odd teams. But yeah, yeah I've played exactly. for a few twice. Um and sort of gone back to clubs, especially when I went non league. I went back to Farnborough as a dual reg when I was at St. Albans. So it adds up. But yeah, I think it's around twenty one now. So it's yeah. it's, it's a lot, but I knew if I wanted to play for a long time and especially when I was in league football, you're only going to get one year deals and stuff. So I knew that it was either do or die and get another deal or I'd be pre-season trialing somewhere moving on. So I knew they'd sort of start to total up, but um, yeah, I've, I've enjoyed every minute playing for every club. So um, yeah, it's, it's good fun, but I'm, I'm hoping that Enfield player manager, I'm hoping this will be my last sort of, Turnout, but you, you never know what you see. <laughs> are you still that? Are you still signed on as a player at Enfield? Yeah, I'm player manager yeah, now, yeah. and obviously, depending on what happens with the season, um, I'll, I'll sign on as a as a player again next year. And um, I've I've had two years now where I've sort of had it cut short, so I've been a bit disappointed because yeah, I might yeah. have maybe ended if I'd have played another thirty odd games, scored. I might have called it a day, but it's like I've had sort of two seasons sort of cut away from me. So. Um, yeah, I'll do pre-season when it, when it eventually starts and see how fit I feel. And if the forwards aren't doing it that I've got in, then I'll, I'll have to play. <laughs> now, um, okay, Jamie, Colin's been very adamant to get this question in. He's even asked yeah. it twice. Okay. So, probably been asked it plenty of times. Oh, Jesus, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but why did Jamie turn down the offer from Manchester United? Now, I need to know this now because Colin's asked it twice. <laughs> Um, it was basically as a sort of an apprenticeship and, and pro contract. So I was at Norwich uh, as a schoolboy. I hadn't signed any forms, but it got to 15, sort of 14, 15, when you meant to basically sign an apprenticeship form and, and, and pro forms. And um, I'd been at Norwich for about a year and a bit. So fairly settled and enjoying it. Um, and then I had a few more clubs start to, to knock on the door and stuff. So I went to, to United, uh, trained for a week come back and, and basically got offered a sort of, I think it was a two-year apprenticeship, two-year pro. And then I had Norwich's offer the same and a few other offers um, and just had to make a decision. Um, and I was one of them, I'm a Man United fan, which makes makes it worse. Um, and I sort of, I don't know if in, in my brain, I, I felt very settled. And then at the same time, Norwich was a club that was, people back in the day wouldn't know, were pushing to win the Premier League. They were a top sort of free side, were in Europe. They were producing kids. Man United were sort of starting to build again, spending money, not really producing kids. So I had a discussion with my dad and basically he said, look, it's down to you. You know, you make that decision. So I decided, I said, look, I'm going to stay at Norwich and, and take their offer. Um, so we let obviously the scout know and stuff at United. Um, and about two days later, I had a phone call at my house. So dad picked it up and Ferguson's on the phone. And um, he's like, is that obviously Mr. Curing? And he said, yeah, yeah, chatting away to him. And he basically sort of just said to my dad, why isn't he coming? Like, why, you know, it's Man United, why aren't he signing? And my dad sort of looked, held the phone and said, look, what do you want to do? And I sort of was carrying in the corner and, and stuck with my decision. And obviously what makes the story worse is, is the class of 92. And that, that would have been my youth team. So that was obviously... The one player, if you look through their squad, they didn't have a centre forward. It was obviously all the boys that broke through and they won the FA Youth Cup. I think I was at Norwich, when I was at Norwich, we got knocked out in the semi-final to Leeds and Man United then beat them. And it was that group of players and they went on and obviously, you know, done what they've done. I think that's why the story obviously gets a bit more hyped up because I'm I'm basically part of, or would have been part of that, that class. And, you know, I went to Norwich, I, I, I made my debut and, and broke in in the Premier League with them, but... Yeah, the when you, it gets brought up, you sort of think, if I would have gone, what would have happened? Would I have been that good to stay with them, or, or would I have fell by the wayside? I, I, you know, I don't know. But yeah, that was that was basically the reason I I, I turned it down. 
So, Jamie, let me get this straight. You would have been part of the Neville's, <laughs> Beckham's, yeah. uh, Gold, but all of them. Jigs. Yes, yeah. Jigs. Yeah, well, when, when, when I went there, that was who I, I trained with. I, I obviously went there for a, like an Easter holiday, played and trained with them, played in a game, did well, scored, and, you know, and then obviously got offered the, the deal. Um, so, yeah, that would have been my youth team. You would have been on the board at Salford now as well. Yes, yeah, I would have been. Uh, well, I would have, I would have been, yeah, a 10% share. Or something. <laughs> so, yeah, it, like I say, it, 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 you, I think about it, don't get me wrong, but, you know, it, it was a decision that was made. And, um, you know, yeah, like I say, my career, my career's gone on. Yeah, my career's gone on. And I do sometimes sit and go, you know, would I have been as good as them and would I have you know, pushed on with them. I think the one thing that I regret about it is I was quite a wild child and I think going there would have helped me more because I don't think Ferguson would have accepted it. Where I think, not saying Norwich did, but yeah. it was, I was stuck out on my own, miles away from family and I, I'd sort of just run riot. And my, my early stage of my career, I was quite a wild sort of child and probably why I didn't stay there as long and didn't play in the Premier League as long as I did because I, I was quite ill-disciplined. And I, I heard stories about obviously what, the boys used to be like Man United and he would turn up at their house and he was, you know, he realised that their careers were more important and stopped it. And I think that is one thing I would have liked is probably that sort of stern hand might have, you know, put me on a straight and narrow a bit more. Can I ask this question yeah. as well? What was going through your mind when Sir Alex Ferguson calls up your blower and he's on the phone your dad and you're like... I, I was, uh, yeah, I was like 15. I was sort of coward in the corner when he said it was him i was like that'd be stupid and like he yeah. was holding the phone out like you know do you want to speak he's to him he's like, like, like this but, hey, it's Alex. It's Alex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want to speak to him and he's, i was like no no, no. I, I said look I'm, and he was sort of basically I, he was like do you want to change your mind it's, it's your choice um and i sort of went look no you know and then that was it and he he said no and it was i've, I've come across him we played oh, when i was at bristol rovers we played a testimonial for lee martin and he brought a lot of his team down and I walked through the tunnel and he knew me instantly, spoke to me, he said, I oh, see you're doing well. So it was like he, he'd followed me as well. Um, so he knew it wasn't yeah, like yeah. he walked past. He knew exactly who I was. He made a comment about turning him down. He, you know, he, he knew his stuff. Wow. And I'd obviously was 21, 22 at the time. So it was a fair few years on. I'd played for Norwich, come to Bristol Rovers. And in this testimonial, he, he pulled me in the tunnel and, and had a chat. And he was good as gold. And, you know, it just shows you that he... he, he does know his football and, and, and concentrated on a hell of a lot, but yeah, when I when they come down to there again, it sort of brought back memories. I've, I've got a picture with Bex in my room from the day, and you sort of think, oh, you know, I could have been his teammate and stuff. <laughs> 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 you could have been on the phone to Bex, but now you're on the phone to us. Yeah, instead. I could be in Miami or something now. I couldn't. I could be coach. I could be doing a lot, but nah, you could, I say what you could probably still do a job in MLS, couldn't you? Playing. Oh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, definitely. I always think I could play higher than what I'm playing. So, <laughs> <laughs> if you, I'll tell you what: if you had taken that call and you had signed for Man United, I very much doubt you'd be manager, player manager of Enfield uh, right now. No, so, and I probably wouldn't have played a thousand games. Cloud. And yeah, exactly. it's probably a hell of a lot. Exactly. Of it would have gone all different. So, yeah, yeah exactly. I, like I say, I don't complain. I, I, you know, the career I've had and the teams I've played for, you know, I, I won't look back and, and complain about any of it. Um, you know, it's been unbelievable. Um, but yeah. you always have little bits in your life and decisions you've made. There's been many in my career where I've joined one club instead of another and it's worked, it hasn't worked. You have that and that's just one and it happened to be at the very beginning of, of my career. And yeah, Like I say, if they wouldn't have had a class of 92, I wouldn't be too bothered, but because they all yeah, exactly. broke through, I was like, oh no, brilliant. I was fair play to your pops though for leaving it up to you. At 15, I don't think yeah. I would have been like, yep, yeah, Alex is coming, I'm sending yeah. you up. <laughs> no, exactly. And I, I think there's a lot of parents that are like that. And, and I've worked in youth football as well, Arsenal. And I think pre pressure from parents is, is huge. And, and my dad was always like that. He, he played non-league football for sort of Cleveland Town, Western and all down the West Country sort of way. And he sort of went, look, it's your decision. You know, you, you do what you've got to do. I mean, I had loads of other offers. I could have stayed in Bristol. I, I could have joined loads of clubs. And he just said, look, your decision and he knew I was a United fan I, I, I you know loved him and stuff but he, he didn't go you are going which I think some parents would have done and said this is I'm taking it out of your hands because this is the better club to go to and you know fair play to him I, I probably wish now he would have done it. <laughs> give me a whack and said you're going up to Manchester <laughs> you know I listen, think most people 
most people associate you with um with no with your days at Norwich. Mm. Uh, obviously because I suppose you've got more exposure because of the Premier League and stuff. Yeah. But uh, most of your games played and goals scored was with Bristol Rovers. Yeah. Um where out of all the clubs you played for, where who was where did you feel most at home? What was the best club? Um there's a few. I felt really at home in Bristol. Um, cause I'd gone back home. Um, I'd, I'd obviously yeah. been away. I left home at 15. Um, and then I'd come back at 21 and, and did four and a bit years. So I felt very settled. I was around all my family again, friends, you know, people that come to watch me were fans were school friends and, and family members. So I felt really at home, really settled. Um, the, the, the Ollie was manager and was a Bristolian knew me well. So he was really good. And, and, and the team that we had, you know, the players we had were, were great. It was a real good group. You know, I was listening you know, earlier, I think when you have a good dressing room, no matter what goes on, you you, you tend to play your best football and you tend to enjoy it more. Yeah. Um, and I was yeah. very fortunate for, for four years, we had a real good dressing room. Um, when players left, you know, the right players come back in. Um, so, yeah, really at home there, uh, probably Reading again, same sort of thing. I moved on and same real good dressing room, still speak to most of them now. And I think that's when you can tell that when you've been at clubs that you still keep in contact with the majority of the players. That's when you know you've yeah. a, you know, been in a good dressing room. Um, and, and I won my first sort of promotion there and um, scored a lot of goals and, and, and that was good. Um, probably Colchester, really, really good. Again, won a promotion there, did extremely well. Still got a group chat, speak to most of the players, you know, all good groups. Um, we had, a tweet, we had a tweet earlier to someone asking you to go back to Colchester. I don't know if you saw yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> I've seen a few things online. Um, <laughs> they did a thing, and this is how crazy they are. They, they did a, a fans um, page about getting me back to, to come and play. So I did an right. interview and everything. And obviously, I've seen the last few results. I've been struggling. Um, so, yeah, I can yeah. see my name being branded around about going back. But, you know, that was a real good club. But they, they, at the moment, they do their things different where everything's promotion through the youth, get them into the first team. And I think for any manager that takes over that, it's tough that you, you don't have a, a budget to go and you know, bring in experience. They want players to come through and the, the owners and stuff, that's how they, what they believe in. Um, but that, again, very good. Exeter was, was really good. Most of the times where I've had good seasons, when you look through my stats, when I've done well and scored, I've always been settled and, and felt comfortable and been in a good dressing room. And sometimes when I haven't, it's not always down to that, but sometimes just I haven't settled where, I, where I'm sort of the club I'm at and, you know, you fall out of the team and, you, you know, sometimes you look at my stats, they go up and down quite quite a bit and all of a sudden I have a bad period and someone's like, oh, he's done. And then I'll join the right club and everything's right and sort of go off again. But I've been lucky with most of the clubs I've played for, even ones that I've not done well at, I've enjoyed the club and enjoyed the dressing room. You know, majority of the time I've, I've been around good good people and good players. So I've been, been very fortunate. Yeah. Last night we was um, we was lucky enough to have Michael Johnson on the show last night, um, England under twenty one manager uh, coach now, and yeah. he had a question. Someone said a question in about um, do you think academy players have it too easy now and are too pampered? Obviously, with your experience as being academy manager at Arsenal, um, what's your sort of take on that? Because none of us was really in a perfect uh, position to actually answer that, answer that question. I would say that. From my time to this time, it is completely different. Um, being in an Arsenal, which is obviously a top, top academy, I would say yes. I think they are. Yeah. Um, yeah. With everything they're given, I think it's brilliant. Listen, I would love to be a, a coming back through the ranks again with, with what you've got, facilities and stuff. But I think there's limits that you can maybe stop. I mean, Arsenal, they would get cabs picking players up, dropping them off. Like, you know, I'd be in the training ground waiting and you'd see a million cabs pull up and take them mm -hmm. home. You know, it, there were certain things which I think that you can teach people or kids about how to get somewhere. And I used to say to a lot of the, the coaches when I was there, I was part-time, and say, if you stopped all these taxis and said, right, you've got to get training tonight, how many would miss it? How many would miss training? How many wouldn't know to get on a bus, to get on a tube? To get a lift from their dad, you know, which is what I had to do. I, you know, I used to cross Bristol to, to Norwich, go paddock and yeah. Liverpool Street underground to get to Norwich for a weekend. I, yeah. but I did it because I wanted to play. When you're given so much, you take away a bit as well. I think, and um, yeah, I think they do get a lot, a hell of a lot. And I think that's maybe why 
you don't get as many that, that come through because I think you take away a lot of hunger from, from yeah. players. Um, and the ones that do have to really, really want it. You know, a lot of the boys yeah. now that are breaking through, um, Bakayo Saka, he was there when I first joined. And you can tell with a lot of them, straight away I've seen him at 16 and you can go, if he carries on yeah. and he has the right mindset, he's going to be doing what he's doing and, and, and he is. And there's a, there's a, there is a lot of them coming through at Arsenal. But I think you do lose some because of how they are treated. They, they, and mm. I think with clubs' power, they give them more money, they give them more things because if you don't, Chelsea will, Man City will. Mm. So a player in the end at 16 has a lot of power. You know, I was hearing mm. players that were going from 16 to signing a scholarship and some of the figures I was hearing, what they were getting for their first pro at 17, I was like, Jesus. You know, this kid hasn't kicked a ball in football, but you're going to pay him probably more than what a championship player is going to get paid who's had 500 games. But yeah. they're so sort of caught on this player could be the next thing. If you yeah. have ability at 16, 17, and you, you're looking like a world beater, the club will bow down to you because they, they, they can't afford for you for them not to. Because if you do make it and they've let you go, and you know, so they will fund so much into it, hoping that you become the one like Bukayo now that's playing. So everything they've thrown in, by him making it, they can lose maybe four or five that they haven't sort of got through. And yeah. I think that's how it works, where when I played, you had to earn your contracts in a way. You know, I, I scored hundreds of goals in youth team football. Like I look now and think if I was doing that like these kids do, someone would have paid £5 million for you at the youth team. And that's what they do. Yeah. And, you know, it was like, right, well, that's youth team. You now have to do it in the reserves. And then you have to break into the first team. Where now it's yeah. like, if you do it at youth team or, or under 23s, you know, half the world know who you are anyway because of social media. You're a star and you've not played a league game. So yeah. it's, I think it's difficult. They have everything and it's a great environment to be in. But I think for kids to have all of that and everyone know who you are, you know, when you're playing in the youth team and stuff, it's difficult then. You have to have a, a good mindset and, and be resilient, you know, because as much as people love you, they're going to hate you if you're not playing well. And you have to come through all that. Where when I played, no one, if you didn't play well, no one really knew apart from the people in Norwich. But if you don't play well now in a youth team or in a 23 game, you know, the whole world knows and you have to, to cope with that. So it's difficult, definitely. And I, I think there are better ways to do, to do it than what they are. But they always say, if we don't do it, someone else will. So, you know, it's, it's a way yeah. they have to keep players, I suppose. So it's a vicious circle. Yeah. Um, got a couple of questions here for you, uh, Jamie. So Daniel uh, Merricks is saying that what manager has had the most impact on you as a player and now as you as a manager? Uh, a lot of managers between 21 uh, clubs tend to shape your philosophy. Yeah, they've all been different. I have to say every manager I've worked under uh, has, has been different. Um, not all been great. And I think you learn more from the ones that, that aren't as great. I think you learn from the poor decisions they make and and how they treat people. Um, I've always just liked to be from going into management. It's, I've always, as a player, was like, be honest with me. That was my biggest thing. If I'm not playing, tell me, tell me why. You know, don't lie. You know, don't ignore me. But just be honest. And I think if you like it or you don't like it, at least you can say, well, I've told you. You know, and I, I always respected that. And I'd have a row with people about it and managers. But I walked away and. You, you couldn't say nothing. The next day, the manager could look at me in the eye and, and speak to me because he's, he's told me the truth where I've tried to do that as a manager and, and treat people right. Um, I think I'm good at man management. I think I'm good with players. I think I understand that everyone's different. And I think that's where I've worked with good managers that they haven't just generalised the whole group. Everyone's completely different and, and you have to treat them different to get the best out of them. And, and I look at it as a manager, my job is to get the best out of each individual and then mould them into a team. And it means if I shout at one, I might have to, you know, put my arm around another and give another one a day off if I need to. And, you know, there's all different ways. And I think the best managers I've worked for have been like that. You know, uh, Ian Holloway was probably one of my, my, my better ones who was a bit crazy, did things off the wall. Um, but all he ever done and all it ever was was to get the best out of you. And, and he'd scream and shout or he'd you'd think you're going in somewhere and he'd take you down the beat, you know, everything was just a bit crazy, but it was all geared to turning up on a Saturday or midweek and then getting the best out of each individual. Um, so, yeah, he was probably one of the most influential, I would say, just on how he was. And he's got a unique style. He's got three deaf kids. So 
he, he's done stuff in sign language. You know, we I've played games where there's no talking, and it's then about like how then important talking is. And you know, he he was very thoughtful about what he'd done. And, and at times when I was young, I used to look think this is crazy. Like he's, he's a madman. But as you get older, you think about it, and then you understand why he's done things. You know, to put things in your head. Um, but yeah, I've had some good ones. Phil Parkinson was very good for me. Uh, Ollie was 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 really good. Um, Alan Pardew. I have to say, it was was really good. You know, I know he, he gets a bad rap at times, and he he was a, quite a cocky, arrogant guy, and and that was what he was like. But he he was a good sort of at the time when I had him, it was his first job at Reading. He was very forward thinking. Um, first person I had to brought sports science in, you know, was working on different things. Um, so he was good, and I, I clash with him quite a lot because I want to play all the time. And most managers, when I don't play, I've got I have a problem, and I'll always sort of have it out. <laughs> And um, it's only been sort of as you get older again, you, you realise why they do stuff and why certain players were picked and, and you weren't um, and stuff. But I still speak to him. Um, and he, he was good, parts really good. And it's funny, I hear a lot of stories from when he's been a manager at West Ham and how people... Were, but he was like that at Reading, just a smaller version. I think the, the better he become, the bigger his ego become. But he was a good guy. He wasn't like someone who was arrogant and, and a dick and you didn't like him. He, he was just had a bit about him and, and, and that was it. Um, yeah. But he was good, you know, and I think you try and pick up stuff. I've had that many. It's hard to pick up stuff from everyone, but you pick yeah. up the good stuff. But I think the bad stuff is the main thing for me that I looked at. And when I've had managers, look, Glenn Rhoda was probably my, one of my worst who, you know, he's had a great career and managed big clubs, but he comes to Norwich and just as a person, I found him very rude, how he spoke to people. Again, just... It's very disrespectful to everyone, not just the players, but staff, the, the, the people who cook the food. And I just looked and, you know, you think that there's nothing wrong with saying hello to someone, being polite. You know, all these people are here yeah. to do a job and, and help your club. And I just, uh, that's one thing I, I took and thought, you know, you can't be like that to people. Even if you don't like the player, if you're not going to pick him, there, there should be nothing ever personal in it. And, and you should always be able to say hello, good morning goodbye and at least then you walk away and I was always as a manager if, if I've dropped someone or left someone out of squad that I've not put a front onto him that, that they if they come to me we can have an honest conversation and and I think they're the things that the, the bad things for managers are one of the things that stick in my mind where I think don't be like that you know I've always had I've had Phil Parkinson who was my captain at Reading he managed me at Colchester and you were always sort of saying that you change and I've always thought, why would you change? I know you have to distance yourself and I know you're not then a pally because you, you, you have to make decisions and I have to drop you and I have to scream and shout. But I never thought there was any reason that why you suddenly go from playing to managing, you have to change completely as a person. And I've had a few that have been like it where they've just changed and you're like, I now don't like you as a person because you are suddenly a manager. You feel you have to be different, you know, and yeah. they're the things that I think you pick up the most, you know, as a manager. And if I carry on in management, you know, I'm always looking at myself and, you know, how can I be better um, and, and stuff like that. But I think for me, a key is to have a good dressing room and be a good man manager and keep the group happy. That's what you have to do. Make sure that you've got 16 players that sit in front of you, whether they're starting or not, that go, OK, I might not like that he's not picked me, but he's been honest and I can't really say anything about it. And I think if you've got that, then you'll, you'll keep a group together. But if you're not, that's where splinters and groups start to go and you've got people stabbing you in the back and talking about you. Um, and it's difficult, you know, to keep players happy. You know, I was the worst person ever. And, and I've seen it now where I've left people out. And they've stormed out of change room fuming and I'm like, I can't have that. And I'm like, OK, I used to be like that. So we need to then see if we can sort this out. And yeah, it's difficult keeping the dressing room happy, I have to say. It's been nice being a player and worrying about me. And now I have to worry about 16 to 18 players. and. That some of them can be a pain in the ass, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> As you'll know. <laughs> Got a quick one for you from Jake. Um, Enfield draw Man United in the FA Cup. Are you starting yourself? 100%. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, 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 do you Sorry, know what? I, you I have thought about stuff like this and I thought <laughs> if I'm playing and playing well, then yes. If not, then I would be sub and I would definitely be bringing myself on at some point so yeah but I, it's hard now I, I mean I'm at the stage even this year I've got a little bit of an injury and pulled myself out and uh, Ollie was playing and, and doing really well um, and I in the end felt quite comfortable because I was tr I had trust in him and he was doing well 
you'd carry on. There was no reason for me to, to mess anything up and bring myself in. And I think that's that's quite important. And I've always said, be, even playing manager, I'll, I'll pick myself if I feel I'm worthy and I'm doing well. If I'm not, then, then I'll manage the team and, and, and go from there. But I won't be a person that goes, I should be playing because I'm manager. I want to get another 100 games on my belt. It's now starting to sort of try and step away from it. But at the same time, I want to play. If I still feel I can, I want to be out. There's no better feeling than playing, scoring. Um, and I still would want to do that. But at the same time, I know that if I can't affect my team out there, then I, I, I won't pick myself and, and I'll, I'll sit on the bench or, you know, not even uh, not even sit on the bench. Yeah. How have you found um, the old Essex Senior League? How have you found that? <laughs> <laughs> From the it's, Premier League to the Essex Senior League? It's been different. I have to say, it's it's the first time I've been in non-league now, I think five years, and I've gone from sort of conference, South, Eastman, and then yeah. down. They've all been brilliant. I have to say, loved every minute. Um, this has been the first time I've been in it where people have been a bit more vocal, um, want to know your business a bit more, um, talk about you a bit more. Everyone seems a bit, a bit more on you type of thing where when I was player manager at Stortford last year you get left alone no one worries about what budget you've got no worries about what players you're signing mm -hmm. seven days mm -hmm. going in drop to the Essex Senior League all of a sudden oh Enfield what's their budget what are they paying why are you putting a seven day in for him come yeah. and then I'm getting messages from people I don't even know I got my phone number messages from managers and and I saw it was the first time I hit non-league and thought Okay, this is a bit more non-league in in a, in a funny way. Where I've got you know turning up at grounds and people are being funny with you and being not letting the team in yeah. the changing rooms and you know starting to become where you go right. Okay, but I've enjoyed it. Listen, I've got no problem with how people are. Um, I think what the problem people have had with us is Enfield have been used to being Enfield. Don't really cause any trouble. You know, low budget, tick along. Now we're trying yeah. to be one of the teams that wants to get amongst it, you know, and yeah. we might be able to come and take your player now, you know, and people don't obviously like that. They don't like change. And I found that people have, some have reacted a bit funny to it because now I can go and offer someone a decent contract. I can come and get maybe your best player. And if he wants to come, brilliant. I'm not doing it because I don't like you and I don't like your club. I need to build a good team to, to be at the top of the league. So I think with change, people don't like it. And I think that's been the biggest thing. And, and, and all of a sudden people go, oh, they must be spending fortunes and they must be. And I know we're not because I know our budget's nowhere near some of the best teams in the league. But yeah. we've put ourselves in a position where we can maybe attract better players. And again, people don't like it. You know, the same sort of teams are used to being at the top. And yeah. if we can suddenly push ourselves in amongst it and challenge it, and maybe I can attract players, people tend to get funny. And it has been the first time where get a bit of animosity against you. And I've been quite in non-league. People leave me alone. It's been brilliant. I've enjoyed my time. Fans have been great. Um, players have had banter. This is the first time there's been a bit more at me. Yeah. And I've had to yeah. sort of get my back up a bit. Nightmare. Yeah. And that's how it seemed. It's literally from being non-league and everything fine, going to Essex Senior, it's suddenly like an explosion goes off and it's different. Yeah. Definitely. It yeah. is different. But okay, I think it's because it's I think fun. every single... Every single manager and player in Essex Senior League had Twitter, I think. That's why. <laughs> I just think it's just like one big, it's like one yeah. big playground. It's just yeah, well, I was, people were telling me stuff was being said and I was like, and I was getting hammered and I'm like, Jesus Christ, we've just come in the league, we're, you know, starting something different. I've just taken over and I was getting back, but I don't read it. You know, listen, it doesn't yeah. bother me. If people are funny and have t things to say about stuff, it's, I just look at it and go, well, you can't be happy with what's going on in your life. If you're bothered about yeah, yeah. what I'm doing and what Enfield are doing, and you yeah. have to really focus on, you know, venting stuff against us. We're just a football club. I'm taking over and trying to do something. And if we do well, brilliant. You know, that, that and that's all we're trying to do is compete in, in a league. But I think it is. I think a lot of players have played for similar teams. I think the managers know each other. I think it's quite a, everyone sort of knows yeah. what goes on and, me coming down and being a bit new and Enfield starting to try and do something, I think has upset maybe a few people. And yeah, I think it's been different, but listen, yeah, I, I don't mind. I, I, you know, I'm, whether we start back now or next season, 
you know, I'll be probably upsetting a few more people by, you know, in the summer <laughs> if I sign a few more players. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, uh, let's, we'll end it there. And uh, hopefully we do get back to seeing you back in the dugout yeah. soon. And me getting yep, back so. in my dugout. Yeah, definitely. Um, and hopefully we can crack on and get started playing football again. But we yeah, appreciate yeah, you yeah. coming on the show. Ah, no problem at all. Love it. Brilliant. And it's been great to hear your story, mate. And I'll, so hopefully I'll see you soon. Yes, definitely. Take it steady. Cheers, mate. Thanks, see you later. Cheers, mate. Yeah, bye, yeah. bye bye. Oh, mate. And that's Saturday night. Oh, another one done. Another one done. Guys, thank you for, for listening in as well. And thank you for all your questions and interactions as well. Um, and thank you once again to all the guests that we've had on, from James to, to Ali to, to your mate, Richo. Yeah, to, and Jamie yeah. as well. Yeah, and all the people asking questions as well. Thanks for tuning in, and to all the people that will watch back. Thank you, thank you. Please let us know what you think. Please do indeed. So again, once again, just make sure you give us a like, comment, and um, again, stay tuned for the next one as well. Next week we've got some really good guests as well, and uh, take care. See you guys all soon. Take care. Yeah, thank you.